Good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, this is Dr. Rivera again. I am um, the Associate Dean for Admissions and Financial Aid. And before I go any further, uh, we can see it on our end, but I just wanted to make sure that you guys can see it on your end. So if that's the case, could you just pop me like a, a quick uh, a note on the question thing so I can make sure that folks can hear me? Perfect. Thank you, guys. And you guys, everybody can see my slide. Good. All right. So um, thank you for joining us for this financial aid webinar. I, I think we'll probably be chatting for about maybe 20 minutes or so going over these slides. Um, but then at the end, you know, hopefully we have a good number of questions so that we can answer any questions you may have about financial aid here at the NYU School of Medicine. Uh, I'm going to get started here by, by um, talking a little bit about the multiple steps we've made over the years, right? So um, I've been in this role since 2010, and Joanne McGrath and I have really worked very hard uh, to reduce indebtedness, right? So our goal has been to get um, the most academically talented, uh, diverse student body because our patients deserve nothing less than the best doctors. Um, that's one goal for admissions. And for the goal for financial aid is to ensure that those students graduate with as little debt as possible. And so to meet that second goal, we've been working with development and with finance to increase our endowment offerings over the years. We've been able to offer a larger number of, um, uh, of full tuition scholarships and then eventually full cost attendance scholarships. But we've also looked at other ways of reducing the cost of getting a medical education. And our three-year MD is, is one of those things where um, graduating in three years comes with a significant net uh, value financially to folks. But really things took a, a dramatic turn um, just uh, what, about two plus months ago when we announced that we uh, became a tuition-free school. And, and this is uh, near and dear to my heart because we've been working on this for over 10 years. And, and uh, you know, we, we started from scratch on this and we've gotten to the point where we have over 450 million of the $650 million endowment that we need to keep this in perpetuity. And we have several years to, to get to that goal and we have every reason to, to believe that we will be there. So what that means to you is that uh, every student who is currently at the NY School of Medicine and every new student that comes in will not have to worry about med school tuition. Um, so everybody this year is getting a $55,000 scholarship and so everyone who gets accepted would, would, would get that. Um, why we did this? You know, when people ask me that, I, I answer, well, why, why wouldn't we if we could? Um, you know, as somebody who, who went through med school and, and came from a very poor background and had to suffer, uh, with the emphasis on the word suffer, with medical school debts as a, as a resident, um, I can speak firsthand to how painful it is to have to, 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 to pay off those things. And, and you know, you're, you're four years out of, uh, out of high school, four years then out of you know, out of college from medical school, you've got anywhere between three to five plus years of residency, and then you get to pay off your loans. <laughs> that's, that's like a challenge. So what we decided was that we as an institution wanted to, to take tuition off the table for folks. And so we've worked hard for over a decade to raise an endowment from scratch that allows us to do that for everybody. Because um, I, I believe education and healthcare are, are public and common goods. And so this is our step at, at, at doing that. And I also believe that it's in patients' best interests to have the very best students um, stay on the path to becoming physicians and to go into careers that they wanna go into because they feel that they are personally suited for those fields and their fields where they feel that they can make a big difference. So um, the impact um, on our students and their families is, is pretty dramatic actually. And so what I've got on the slide here are just projections um, that we've made based on the first year's classes borrowing, right? So the first year class that started is the first class that will go through all four years um, having these tuition-free scholarships. And so what we did was we looked at their first semester borrowing. And based on that, we've made projections. And granted, it's, it's a projection, mind you, but projections on what that would be if their borrowing continued at similar levels throughout their three and four years here. We then made assumptions that just like in the graduating class, roughly 25% of the class will graduate in three years by joining the three-year program and, and the remaining will 75% uh, will graduate in four years. And then we took that debt and then discounted it back to 2017 dollars. Why? Because 2017 is the last year for which we have comparative national data. Um, and in 2017, you can see that the AAC reports that the average or rather the median amount of medical educational debt, the debt that you get from medical school is 180,000. 
and the 72% of medical school graduates had debt. The first year class, how does that compare to those numbers? Well, they would not, 72% of them wouldn't have debt, but instead only 28% would have debt. And of those people who had debt, the median wouldn't be 180,000, but it'd be 77,000. So um, in some far fewer people have debt. And of those people with debt, they have far less debt. So that's a pretty dramatic difference. 77,000 uh, would put us um, in the number two position, or rather the number one position for, uh, for debt. Um, and the 28% would put us in number two, only behind the Uniform Health Services Med School, which requires medical school service for everyone. So I'm not gonna count them. So I'll, we'll be number one for both of those things. And that, that's nice to be able to, uh, to really drop debt that much for folks. Um, so here's the cost of attendance uh, for the current first year class. Um, and uh, we're putting this in terms of, uh, instead of the cost of attendance for what would be your first year class starting in 2019, only because that cost of attendance budget hasn't been finalized. It's never finalized until the beginning of January. So the best thing that we can do is show you the current cost of attendance, and then just realize that the cost typically increased two to 3% per year. So. Uh, for this year, the tuition is 55000 but again, that gets offset by a matching full tuition scholarship. And then the rest of the costs, as you can see there on the left, uh, I mean, the majority of those costs are costs that folks would have any, even if they weren't going to medical school, right? So health insurance, um, for some folks, they may still be covered under their parents, so then that would be waived. Uh, books and supplies and the loan fees and the regular fees, those are the incremental costs, but room and board, you know, um, so basically, after the full tuition scholarship, you're talking about a cost of about 27000 for the first year. And so some students will be able to pay for that out of savings. Um, uh, other students may, uh, may have to take out loans. Um, but regardless, uh, 27000 is a lot more palatable than 82000 um, And in terms of the types of financial aid that we offer, so the tuition scholarship will be awarded uh, to the majority of our students. Uh, a smaller group will continue to get merit scholarships, wherein about, I believe the numbers are somewhere close to 20% of MD students will get full cost attendance rise. Um, and then, as we said, there are federal loans to provide um, for that those living expenses for those folks who need it. So just one last word on merit scholarships before I hand it over to Jonathan Chancellor, who's our Director of Financial Aid. Um, there's nothing else that you have to fill out application-wise for these. Um, they are full cost of attendance scholarships that cover all of the budgeted items you see here on the right. Um, you know, so for example, the room and board, it covers a $13,360 towards housing here at NYU. Some students may choose to live off campus, in which case that amount gets credited to you and then you would use that towards the rent that you would pay at that spot. They are automatically renewed on a yearly basis for your three or four years of medical schools, assuming, of course, that you're making satisfactory academic progress and that all professionals and standards are being met, but that's that's almost never an issue. Um, and uh, these are great scholarships to, to get because at the end of the day, you, you end up graduating with zero dollars in debt. But nevertheless, uh, you know, everyone else gets a full tuition scholarship, which is, uh, I, I could just say, I wish I had gotten a $57,000 or $56,000 scholarship when I was in school many years ago. Um, so for that, I'm going to now transfer it over to Jonathan. So Jonathan will talk to you about loans, and then we'll talk about any questions you guys may have. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rivera. Um, as Dr. Rivera said, my name is Jonathan Transler. I'm the Director of Financial Aid here at NYU School of Medicine. So what I'll do is I'll get into a little bit more of the finer talking points about the actual financial aid programs that we have here at NYU School of Medicine. Not quite as exciting as the tuition free, but um, we still go through it for you anyway. Um, one of the first things we'll talk about is student loans, because as Dr. Rivera said, while we do cover the tuition with our tuition scholarships, um, many students do or might want to take out some student loans to cover those additional costs that we show them the cost of attendance. Um, for those, you would just need to make sure that you do your FAFSA. Many of you have probably done a FAFSA already as an undergrad student. Um, if not, of course, we can always help you with that. So when you go to the FAFSA website, we ask that you complete that. We ask that you put parental data in there as well. It's something that we like to see on the FAFSA um, for all of our students so that we can have a complete financial profile for our students. Um, and then you also notice that we ask that you use the IRS data retrieval. 
Um, th that data retrieval tool is makes the FAFSA a lot easier. Now that the FAFSA uses prior prior year, you can actually use that, that tool and it will populate the FAFSA for you. So for any of you who have not done a FAFSA in the past, um, I would really advise you to do that because that way you're going to be able to have all of that data brought in directly from the IRS um, and that will make sure that your FAFSA is 100% accurate. So as far as the process is concerned, um, the only application we really have is the FAFSA that we ask for students to complete. Um, we don't really have an official deadline. Now, as someone who's done financial aid for quite some time, I always tell students, please do your FAFSA as soon as you can, just so that we can make sure to get all of the information reviewed um, and make sure that everything does come in as it should, because everyone knows, of course, there can be little hiccups along the road. So we're here to help you get through that. So that's why we ask that you do it as soon as you possibly can. Um, you'll see that our school code there is the 002785. Um, that's going to be the same as NYU as a whole. Um, so it's going to be the same that they had at Washington, Washington Square. So NYU is, is the general code for the FAFSA. As far as tax documentation is concerned, again, that's why I mentioned using the IRS data retrieval because um, it's a lot easier to do rather than taking tax documents and looking through line by line and following the individual instructions on the FAFSA telling you to go to line B, A, and, and whatnot. So if you use the data retrieval, it's going to make it a lot more simple for you. And again, because it's prior prior year, you should already have those taxes filed. So it should link directly to the IRS website for you. So common problems to avoid, again, don't wait until the last minute and don't wait until you've actually applied. Um, to, to or get, get admitted um, before you apply for financial aid. As long as we have your data in, if you have any questions or concerns or wanna ask us anything about the, the information we have, we can look at that. Um, obviously, if you don't apply, we don't have it. So that's why we are constantly asking students to do the applications as soon as possible use the IRS data retrieval because it's going to reduce any errors that you might have. And it also gives us that access to look at all the information we need in order to make sure that your financial aid package is the best that we could possibly give you. Um, the FAFSA is always available now on October 1 of the year that you apply for admission. So for any of you applying to start next fall 2019, the FAFSA is already available. It's been up since October 1, so you can go ahead and complete that right now. Um, important dates to remember. Again, October 1, I'll mention that again, just to say that the FAFSA is available, so please get that done for us as soon as possible. Again, don't wait until you get any notification on the admissions process. Go ahead and complete the FAFSA so that we can look at it. Um, and then we say early March is a good time to go ahead and make sure that that is in, because again, we don't have a, a specific solid deadline, but the earlier you get us the data, the earlier we can get you a financial aid package. And that way you can have all of your financial aid ready to go. You don't have to worry about that over the summer before you actually begin and, and start here at NYU. We can work on that throughout that month of March and April to make sure that everything's set. Um, and again, if there are any errors, we can correct them. If there are any issues or questions, we can address those properly. Um, and again, just make sure that finances aren't something that you really have to worry about um, before and even while you're here at NYU studying an Ahmed program. So here's our contact information. Um, so in person, we are right across from the hospital on First Avenue. And that of course is our telephone number. So, and then there's our email. Um, if you have any additional questions after this webinar, please feel free to contact us and let us know. We're available at nine to five, Monday through Friday. Um, and like I said, we're, we're always here to help you get through the process of applying for financial aid and also answering any questions you may have as you go along the way. So I think that really concludes what I had to say here. So what we'll do is Dr. Rivera and I will open it up for any questions that you guys may have. So you can just start shooting those our way and um, we'll get those taken care of for you. So just a couple of things, you know, um, you don't have to fill out the FAFSA if all you want is that tuition scholarship. That will automatically be given to everyone uh, regardless of need or merit. You would only have to fill out the FAFSA um, if you are applying for one of those federal loans, right? Correct. Um, and we also do have uh, additional scholarships that can that um, that may require um, evidence of need. Um, and so for that, you would have to fill out the password. So let's see, what questions do we have? Um, okay. All right. Um, there's a couple thank yous uh, for the tuition free. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. It's um. It's been a. Uh, it's been really amazing, actually, seeing um, the positive responses. I saw a, um, a survey today. I forgot to tell you guys about that. Well, I think I told you. But from Kaplan had reached out to uh, 
med school deans across the country uh, to find out if they had plans to, to move forward uh, with something similar. And I, I, I think that um, the overwhelming majority of people thought that it, it was a, a major step in the right direction and some schools were, were going to try to follow. Um, I'm hoping that um, that other schools, you know, follow in our footsteps here and, and do something about it because medical school debt, it's it's a bigger problem than than I think people have given it credit for over the years. And, you know, if you look back in 1986, um, the average medical school graduate had about a $70,000 average debt in today's dollars. Uh, when the average debt is uh, over 190,000, including pre-med debt, you know, things have just gotten out of hand. And so I, we're just glad to be able to, to do something uh, on this scale. So let's see. Um, I, okay. The, the, so everyone is considered for additional merit scholarships without the FAFSA. That is correct. Um, the uh, all you have to do is to uh, be eligible for merit scholarships is to apply. The admissions committee makes those determinations as they review the applications. And then given the number of scholarships that we have, we then start awarding them out in the fall. We're a little bit later on that than I would like this this year, but we're hoping to start awarding more of them in the month of November. Um, and then throughout the year, continuing into early January. Um, but worst case scenario, if somebody doesn't get a full cost of tenant scholarships, they still have the full tuition scholarships. I heard that smaller schools might have some difficulty following the footsteps of NYU and Vagelos when it comes to this type of help. Um, so, you know, it, it's interesting. Um, uh, I was asked that question by a reporter once who said, she uh, said, aren't you afraid that this is now going to create two tiers of schools, uh, one school that can do that, that can afford to do that, and another school that, that can't do that? And so, you know, I, I, I said, well, there, there are two things that, that I'd like to respond to that with, which is one, that there's two ways to skin a cat. Um, and one is to reduce, you know, to reduce indebtedness, you can reduce the cost per year. And so that's what we've done with these tuition free scholarships. The other thing you can do is to reduce the number of years of training. And that's what the three-year MD does. That, that's one of the reasons we did that. And, and we actually do both of the primary means of reducing debt. So schools can pick and choose what they want to do to tackle the debt problem, but, but they should do something. Um, and the second piece is people have to remember that we were one of those schools that, you know, 10 plus years ago, people wouldn't have thought we would be able to do that. We started with an endowment of around 10, $15 million, which, for all intents and purposes, is is zero, you know, uh, when it comes to an endowment. Um, and you know, the, when when I see schools that are sitting on multi-billion-dollar endowments and are are not putting it towards their students, I I I, I do ask myself why. Um, and I'm I'm hoping that more student more schools will start to do that. I and I based on that survey, uh, there were four percent of schools who said they were they were actively looking to do that. Um, so um, I think. Given the sample size, I think that worked out to be three. I'm hoping it's a lot more than that. Um, but you know, time will tell, of course. Uh, okay. Are there special circumstances where students cannot provide their parents' financial information? If so, is it possible to still be considered for financial aid through loans, grants? Why don't we switch seats so I can uh, okay. delete the ones that, um, yeah. Um, yeah, to, to answer your question, yes, there are. Um, if you're in a certain situation where you are unable to provide any parental data uh, or financial information, you could just reach out to our office um, and we look at those on an individual basis. Um, so we would just handle that, looking at the situation, look at why you can't really provide that. Um, and then we'll work with you one-on-one um, -on -one just to see what we can do to maybe um, remove that data from your, from your financial aid application. Okay. So I got that question, that one, and that one. All right. So the next one says the same thing. If we receive no parental support, is it still the same protocol? Yeah, and, and there's a little bit. Of, there, there is a, a, a fine difference between not receiving parental support and not being able to provide any parental data. Um, you know, we still do have to look at every student the same. So even if you're not receiving actual support. Um, financially from your parents, we do ask that you put their data on the FAFSA so that we can review you in the same manner that we do other students. Okay. All right. So the next is a question that they want answered offline. So we'll, we'll answer that one offline. Um, but uh, I think we've actually been able to get through most of the questions already. Um, 
So we didn't have a plan as to what would happen if there were no questions. <laughs> so, yeah, that doesn't uh, happen very often. No, <laughs> no, not at all. Yeah, I mean, we don't have a shtick for that. So yeah, um, not good but, on the fly. Uh, well, Meryl, thank you for uh, the, the the kudos. I, I appreciate that. Um, you know, I I um, I would say that um, one of the nice things about the tuition free thing is that it's really increased the national debate, the national discussion. On, on the rising costs of, of education as a whole, right? And you, you're now starting to see some other colleges now that are also going tuition free. Um, and yeah, I, I, I do believe that um, education and healthcare, those are two things that we as a society should all have. And you know, when people talk about being economically competitive, well, you're not economically competitive if the workforce is not educated and if they're not healthy. So um, hopefully, this will definitely start a, tr a trend and true. And so one of this, um, one of our participants described the toll on the well-being of our students and professionals, right? And, and and that was one of the things we had talked about when we were deciding to do this, which is that the stress of having, in some cases, three hundred thousand dollars in debt when you're graduating. Um, I don't know of anybody who can take that and not worry about that debt. Um, People coming into medical school differ uh, from their uh, don't differ from their other non-medical school classmates in terms of measures of anxiety, depression. But after they grew, go through medical school, after they go through residency training, those levels increase over the general population. And I do believe that one of those factors is because of the debt that people have, right? And so, um, if there's anything we can do to reduce stress, and we have a fairly comprehensive wellness initiatives program here, um, but if there's anything else we can do. Why wouldn't we do that? And, and I, I think that finances are one of those stressors. And, and I think it's a moral imperative to take that off the table whenever you can. So the next question is, if your parents are receiving Social Security, is that considered income? Um, it's weighed differently on the FAFSA. Um, it is part of the FAFSA, but it is weighed differently. It's not weighed the same as wages or part of any adjusted gross income. Um, but the FAFSA takes that into consideration when they do the calculation for your expected family contribution. Um, the next question says, so if you are dependent on your parent, uh, dependent on your parents' income, um, so if you are dependent, your parents' income will still be considered for financial aid. Sorry, I'm 34 and I've been independent and working for a while now. My parents do well, but I'm no longer dependent on them. Will their income affect the amount of financial aid I will be able to receive? Well, you're actually right on the cusp of our cutoff line, uh, to be perfectly honest with you. So once you reach the age of 35, um, we actually will ask you not to put parental data on the FAFSA, but um, it's, it's at the time that you actually do the application. So once you do the application, the FAFSA is automatically going to show you as an independent student. Um, but that's why we push for students to put parental data um, on the FAFSA, because we do want to use that. But we do have an age cutoff as well. So and 35 is that. But just to emphasize again, uh, those tuition-free scholarships, those merit scholarships, they're not dependent on need. Everyone gets those, right? So it doesn't matter the, the numbers you post on that. Everyone gets those. Correct. It will matter for any additional need-based scholarships that we, we have. And so, you know, our plan uh, for the last several years has been to be a tuition-free school. We've gotten to that point. Uh, you know, where would I like to go next? I'd like to be a cost-free school. Um, and um, so at that point, you know, um, we would probably not even have to have a FAFSA of anyone. Um, but until then, if you want those federal loans, then federal guidelines require that you do fill out the FAFSA. So thank you for hosting. You're, they ask, will this class, will the class size be decreasing? No, uh, the class size is again 102, uh, of which about 10 are MD PhD students and 92 are MD students. And that's that's stable. Okay. And are there any merit-based scholarships or are all grants need-based? So again, none of our scholarships, um, the tuition-free scholarships are not dependent on need or merit. So if you are accepted to the NYU School of Medicine, you will automatically get those scholarships and you will continue to get them for the duration of your medical education here, as long as you are in good academic standing. So no, emphasis on need, no emphasis on merit. The merit scholarships also have no need-based component. That's just dictated by the merit of your application as determined by the admissions committee that reviews your application. So 
Um, I, I hope I've stressed that because everyone is going to be getting the tuition free scholarship who is an MD student here. Now, a little caveat on that is some students end up going into the MD PhD program. Um, those students full costs are covered uh, by a combination of NIH grants and institutional resources. So the tuition free scholarship don't apply to them because they have no costs whatsoever. The other group are the MD dual degree master's program students, and they will continue to get the tuition free scholarship while they're a medical student at NYU. But when they go off to our sister school, say Stern to get their MBA or Wagner to get their MPA, then they go into the financial aid office for that school. So these are tuition free scholarships towards their medical education. Just wanted to clarify that. Okay. Um, Jonathan, is the cutoff for the FAFSA app start or NYU app start? I'm sorry, is the cutoff for the FAFSA app NYU app start? Hmm. I, I, when, you, when you say cutoff, I, I assume are you, you might be talking about the age. Um, if it's the age, then it's, it's whenever you actually file the FAFSA, whatever your age is at that time. Okay, for the merit-based scholarships, is there a set amount given to everyone for housing? For example, if someone is married and would like to live with their spouse, is that taken into account? Yeah, so the merit scholarships will cover everything that you see here on this slide. This is, of course, last year's cost of attendance when the next year's cost of attendance is finalized in, in typically in January, um, then we will cover all the costs on that cost of attendance budget. Figure you take 82,000 and, and uh, add 3%, give or take maybe 2%, depending on, on which expenses increase less or more than prior years. Um, so for room and board, you would be getting that $13,360 figure that would then go towards covering either your housing here and it would cover your housing here typically in full, or it would go towards your housing elsewhere. And, you know, I, I would not say that New York City is a cheap place to live. Um, so, you know, if you're going to be living elsewhere, then you would probably have to subsidize your rent with your own funds for that. So if, if at all possible, I would recommend that you live in, in NYU housing. Um, all our single students are guaranteed housing. And for married students, they try to accommodate them as many as they can. Um, if that is the case, if you are married and you are accepted, I would reach out to the housing office, reach out through us to the housing office um, as soon as you can um, so that they can then put you into the process to get one of their larger rooms. Okay, perfect. Um, so yes, the individual, we will email you with the response to your question. Um, what if you are under the cutoff age when it comes to being considered independent from your parents, but you are married? In this case, you would still need to provide your parents' financial information? Yeah, we, we still do ask for that, um, just because of the fact <laughs> that it does give us a whole view of the entire family financial aid, um, because that's what we really do re require. Um, but again, as Dr. Rivera has stressed, the tuition-free scholarship is going to happen. It's just if you're looking for anything outside of that, then that's when you would want to make sure to put that information on. Right. So what I want people to focus on is this bottom number. I don't know if you can see the cursor here, but this the cost of attendance is essentially going to be 27,000 for folks because we are taking 55,000 off the table for these merit for these uh, full tuition scholarships. So these are the expenses: the fees, the health insurance, books and supplies, room and board, miscellaneous loan fees if you have them that then you would have contributing to this $27,000 figure. That's the 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 number that you're going to need to either come up with out of savings or come up with out of loans. And if you want the loans the federal loans and you have to apply, you have to fill out the FAFSA for that reason. If all you're applying for is the, if all you want is that tuition scholarship, you don't have to fill out the FAFSA. Okay, you don't, because you're gonna automatically get this. It's not dependent on need, it's not dependent on merit. All it's dependent on is getting into the school and then staying, you know, making satisfactory academic progress. So the next question is, would you advise that we begin conversations with private banks for personal loans in the event that we are not granted loans sufficient to cover our cost of attendance? No, we, we wouldn't do that. Um, there, there's really not much of a reason that a student wouldn't be eligible for the unsubsidized loan, uh, which would reach that 27108 number that you see right there in the cost of attendance. Um, the only few reasons that a student wouldn't be eligible for one of those is if A, you don't do your FAFSA, or B, you do a FAFSA and it shows that you're actually delinquent on a past direct loan. 
Um, other than that, the unsubsidized loan program is not need-based. Once you do the FAFSA and the Department of Education gets your data to us, you will be eligible for that loan. Um, the, uh, the only other reason I can think of off the top of my head is if you've used up all of your eligibility for unsubsidized loans. And as a medical student, the maximum amount of unsubsidized loan you could receive is over $200,000. So it's highly unlikely any of you are coming into med school with debt in the unsubsidized loan program over that number. So I really stress to students, do the FAFSA. Um, the direct loan program is much better than most likely what you're going to find outside of NYU or the Department of Education. And again, there's just very few reasons I can think of why you wouldn't be eligible for those loans. And it would cover that cost. I was just going to ask you, would there be any reason aside from not getting enough money, which doesn't seem like that's the issue, but would there be any other reason why you would want a private loan over one of these federal loans? No, no. You know, we, we, we do, a, we, we actually pride ourselves on counseling our students and talking to you about your loans as you move through uh, the three to four years that you're here. And that's a common question. Students asking, should I look for an outside loan? And my answer is always no. Um, we talk to you on a regular basis about the different loan repayment options that you have with the Department of Education. The Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program is still out there right now um, as we speak. So, no, um, as, as someone who's been doing financial aid, like I said, for quite some time, I always advise students stick within the direct lending program uh, because that's going to be your best. Um, and, and, you know, on that same topic, uh, if you can borrow less, borrow less. One of the big things that, uh, you know, we, we try to tell folks is, learn to live frugally during your resident years or during your medical student years and during your resident years so um every dollar that you save while you're a medical student and a resident is compounded in your favor um you know one of the things that that hurt me with the debt was that you know i, I had the debt that i couldn't pay while i was a resident because i was trying to pay off my credit cards and so what couldn't i do because i was paying those things off well i couldn't put money towards my retirement the best time to put the money in is when you're young and in your 20s. If you can start contributing that early, it it just has that much more time to grow. So one of our hopes is that then by taking tuition off the table for folks, people can start looking out after their retirement that much earlier. So the, the key point of that whole you know ramble was take out the bare minimum loans that you need. Don't take out any more than you have to because of compounding interest. It balloons before you know it. Do you have any advice for scholarship resources before matriculation? Google is a terrible first step, as it is hard to see through the forest, as it were. I, I always tell students, you know, I, I, there's no, there's really no reason to sugarcoat it. Um, most of your outside scholarship opportunities are going to be for undergrad students. Um, but that is also one of the reasons that we ask students to put the data that we do on the FAFSA if you do apply so that we can look out for those um, on your behalf. There are um, a few foundations that reach out to us and say we have a, a scholarship for medical students that are from a certain area of the country or they, they are from a certain background or they have a certain amount of need. Um, that's why we ask you to put that data on the FAFSA so that we can actually do that legwork for you. Um, because to be perfectly honest, most of those funds are going to be for undergrad students. It's going to be pretty hard to find anything once you reach that graduate level or above. Okay. Just out of curiosity, how has your applicant pool changed, grown, different demographics, et cetera, since making the tuition-free announcement? So, you know, our, our deadline just, um, our primary deadline just passed on October 15th. Uh, I'll say that, you know, we made the announcement at our white coat ceremony here on, in August, mid-August. Um, and despite making it after, you know, uh, the time point when we historically get our, our big bulk of applications, right? Most most of our applications hit us in in um, in July and August, and then they start sort of teetering up thereafter. We saw another spike thereafter. Uh, I mean, I guess it's no surprise. Um, last year we had about six thousand applications for the hundred and two spots. Uh, right now we're projected to hit around nine thousand, um, so you know, a fifty percent increase. Um, how has the, the demographics changed? Well, you know, we're, we're seeing that, you know, some positive signs that that the socioeconomic diversity of that pool may be increasing, right? And so we were discussing some of the pool uh, figures yesterday and the number of students who apply with fee waivers has, has increased. So so that's, that's a good thing to see because, uh, you know, uh, we're big advocates of diversity on all different fronts. And one of the, I think, fronts that hasn't gotten as much attention as it should is socioeconomic diversity. Um, and um, so hopefully we'll, we'll have some good news to report there. So the next person says that's 27,108 per year for housing and other things, correct? Yes. So essentially that is your cost of attendance. 
after you factor out the full tuition scholarship that all students get regardless of need or merit. So 27,000, you know, times four or, or three, if you do the three year, that's the most you would end up getting uh, if you wanted to pay out of pocket and you did all of these items. But again, you can start chipping away at things, right? So these are just, you know, uh, budgeted items. And for example, if your parents uh, can still cover you under their health insurance plan, then that's $5,064 less that you would have. Um, you know, uh, if, if, if you've got a place in the city already, uh, awesome. <laughs> and then you don't have to worry about their room and board. And so that's not something that then you have to take out a loan for. So 27,108 is the most that you would have, um, assuming you were living on NYU housing and within those means. Oh, and one last thing, remember those are 2018 to 2019 budget. Next year's budget will be a little bit higher. That'll be finalized in January. And then we'll put that on our website as soon as we get that. Uh, following up on what you said for Jonathan, being delinquent on a past direct loan could mean, for example, if you're delinquent on monthly payments for debt from undergrad? Correct. So the Department of Education will let us know that. Once you complete a FAFSA, it will let us know if for some reason you are behind delinquent or in default on one of your federal loans. And if that's the case, then you would have to alleviate that delinquency before we could offer you any unsubsidized loan. So thank you for the informative presentation and for leading the way in alleviating debt burden for physicians. Um, do you anticipate you will be able to continue to offer free tuition in the event that inflation raises the value of tuition in the coming years? Yeah, actually, so uh, our models, you know, are predicated on historic, you know, uh, returns on the market, both positive and negative gains. Um, and they're also predicated on traditional 3% or so increases over time. Um, so we have every reason to believe that those numbers should hold in perpetuity. Um, we've raised 450 of the 650 million that we need. Um, over the last year, we've raised over 240 million of that. Um, since we made the announcement, we've raised about another 15 plus million um, in this, this short little period of time. So um, yeah, I, I don't think that that's gonna be a problem and we're gonna continue increasing it from there. I've already used 60,000 for my graduate studies. What if the lo total of loans comes out above the 200,000? If, if you do happen to exceed that number, then you could also, the FAFSA is also an application for the PLUS loan. Um, we, we don't generally advertise it as much because with the implementation of the tuition scholarship, most students aren't gonna be getting into that. Uh, but there's also the PLUS loan. So you could do a graduate PLUS loan. The biggest difference between the PLUS loan and the unsubsidized loan is a 1% difference in the interest rate. Um, but we would also offer that to you. So if for some reason you are at your maximum with the unsubsidized loan program, we also review that. Um, and then we would just offer you the plus loan to make up the 27,000 you see there. Right, but again, if, if you've got 60,000 in debt um, and the max is 200,000, uh, there's no way you're gonna get yeah. there, even if you were to take out the full 27,000 each year. Um, you know, at, at another school, if you had to cover the full 82,000, then then absolutely you'll, you'll, you can get there. But with 27,000, you're gonna be good. Um, thank you for hosting this webinar. It's so incredible. I don't want to use focusing on lifting the financial mental burden of debt to benefit your future positions. Thank you. Um, and uh, we're not done yet. So uh, we're hoping to, to uh, do more from there. Um, I'm almost paid off and appreciate the insights of this one individual. Yes, uh, being out of debt is a, is a wonderful thing. Um, so we'll um, hang out for about another five minutes or so. Uh, if any questions come on through, um, and um, and if not, then we'll sign off then. But just to let folks know, we put on a um, a handout of these slides. So you should be able to download it um, from the the webinar palette there. Um, if you have any other questions uh, that come up after the end of the webinar, then then feel free to contact us at these addresses. Right. So, um, you know, if you're in the neighborhood, you know, uh, pop on down, give us a call beforehand and schedule some time with Jonathan. Um, you can use that number there to schedule the time. Um, and email is probably the best way. So shoot an email to finaid at nyumc.org um, or actually finaid at nyulangone.org. That will be changed, but either address will work. 
Um, and then Jonathan and Shama will, will be able to get back to you shortly. Perfect. Okay, so I'm told that, uh, yeah, you, you can click on the uh, PDF and it opens a web page that you can then save or print the document. So, um, all right. So now um, the one student asked for the confidential question, we will then respond to the email that we have on file there. Um, but it's it's been our pleasure chatting with with you all and and, and thank you for uh, for hearing us out on, on our, our, our debut this year, the tuition free. Um, if, again, if you have any other questions, just let us know. Um, and I wish you all the very best in the admissions process. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Thank you guys. Bye-bye.